Welcome to the June 19th Board of Education meeting. If you can take a minute to silence your cell phone and then join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of allegiance. So at the end of the Pledge of Allegiance, we always say with liberty and justice for all, and should acknowledge uh, today's Juneteenth, so happy Juneteenth, everybody. Um, John, can you take a roll for us? Please? Absolutely. Uh, President McFarland is not here. Vice President Rausch. Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach is not here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Member Horowitz. Here. Excellent. We have a quorum. Okay, so moving on to item number two, which is a consent agenda. Item 2.1, or approval of the minutes from June 5th. Item 2.2, the staff, <clears throat> the below staff is being recommended for hire as listed in your agenda packet. Item number 2.3, teachers attaining tenure status as listed in your agenda packet. Item 2.4, the below staff announced their resignation effective of the following dates as listed. Item 2.5 or approval of the school system's bills in the amount of $6,569,700. And then finally, item 2.6, um, approval is requested to authorize legal payments to the below list for professional legal services. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda 2.1 through 2.6. I'll second the motion. Motion by Ringgold, support by Horowitz. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right. We're going to take one deviation from the agenda, and Mr. Shero, um, Floor is yours. Yeah, Lynn only thought you got our remarks, so we, we did not get your gift in time. And so you know, we traditionally give a gift to the board members when they leave for their service. And, and I should know the amount of years was 17? 22. 22. <laughs> 22. And it was the last, uh, in the last one here tonight, it was on the board that hired me. So very good. So 22 years of service. And one thing I say about Lynn is she did always say a lot, but when she spoke, we all listened. And so, we very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And then, Mike, you don't know this, but we have one more surprise for you. <clears throat> Dave, can I get a, a mic? So Representative Schutte is going to come up and help me with this one. So Mike, you have to stand up. Because <laughs> if, if any, for anybody that's been to a school board meeting before, we always did a shining star. And one of the things that Mike always said at the start was, you have to come up here and be embarrassed for a second so I can say something, something about you, right? All right, so. <laughs> so Mike, this is your last board meeting. As a board, we want to say thank you for your years of service and to tell the public a little bit about Mike. Ten years as a teacher coach, ten years as a high school principal, 19 years as a superintendent, two states, five districts, 40 board over 40 board members that you've worked with, and 460 board of education meetings between two districts. So, you know, if I can say a couple things about Mike, you know, one of the things that always sticks with me is Mike always had an attention for kids that struggled. And that is where his heart and his passion always lied. And I think I speak for both board members and the administration when I say the hardest thing you have to do in this role, in any of these roles, is sit through an expulsion hearing. But at every single expulsion hearing I sat in with Mike, 
I, well, I'll call it love tough because it wasn't tough love. Mike always led with love. And he was always tough, but he always led with love. And you always made a point to figure out how to educate our kids, whether they were in our buildings or not. And that was one of the things that always stuck with me. And <clears throat> a legacy or a set of actions that somebody takes that leaves something behind. And I think, you know, along those same lines of three things that stick with me, Mike, in the legacy that you will leave this district are starting Carpenter and the Early Childhood Center, starting GSRP program and MPS, starting the past alternative high school for students that are on the brink of dropping out and curtailing our dropout rate. And then third, advocating for 31A funding for our at-risk students. So with that, I think on behalf of the whole board, we just want to say thank you for your years of service and congratulations on your retirement. And, uh, and Mr. Chair, I wanted to say as a, as a proud product of Midland Public Schools, it was my honor to be able to work on getting a full state tribute for you. So that's a tribute that's signed by myself, our State Senator Kristen McDonald Rivett, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, and uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. It's not an easy job being a superintendent. You do this because you care. Yep. <laughs> um, and you do this um, because uh, you want our kids to succeed. And um, just personally for me as uh, an alum of Carpenter Street School, um, the way you continued the legacy of that school um, is something that means a lot to me personally. And I know it's made a, a big impact in this community. So I don't know what you have planned for retirement. I'm sure your 7 p.m.s on Monday are gonna be freed <laughs> up. Um, so I wish you the best in retirement and it was uh, great to be able to present this to you So with that, we still have a board meeting to, to conduct, so we're not going to let you off the hook too easy. Um, so item number three, uh, Board of Education Matters, item 3.1 for action is the 2022-23 final budget amendment. Mr. Brutin. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to present our final budget amendment for the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, and then ask for your official adoption this evening of the fiscal year 24 budget. So much briefer presentation than last time, just a very high level overview of each. This is the very final step in the process to do those two actions that I just mentioned to you. The next actions that we have related to this fiscal year 23 budget is the audit, which our pre-audit is already underway right now. It commences the first two weeks of July and our business office team will be very busy um, meeting with our auditors and making sure that our financial statements are ready for their review. The disclaimers, um, we still do not have a state aid budget yet for 24, so that means that the revenues that I projected for you at the last meeting, I have not changed those at all. So we're still awaiting that final budget to come out. Hopefully that happens in July, and then we'll be able to revise on um, what our revenue estimates are. ESSER 3 and 11T, this is the same one that I put for you before. We're gonna continue to monitor those expenditures as the year progresses to make sure that we have all of those funds spent by September 30 of the following year to make sure that they're being put to the best use for MPS kids. And then finally, variance is a term that I repeat very often when it comes this time of year. And I do wanna stress variance now, as our expenditure line has started to rise, a 1% variance for us is around $1.2 million. So if we miss by 1%, um, that 1% is starting to add up to dollars that become a little bit more substantial than they have been in the past. So we'll talk about what my predictions are in just a second here related to those. This is your final amendment of the current fiscal year general fund. If you looked all the way over to the right, we are anticipating in the very top line about $5.9 million more in revenues than what I had presented to you in March. If you remember the last presentation, I mentioned this term to you is called GASB 96. I'm gonna urge you to 
have a little bit of patience with your business office team here at Midland Public and business offices around the state as they continue to grapple with this new accounting requirement. This is again where we basically have to amortize all of our software agreements. So for us, that was roughly $3 million of revenues that we had to put onto our books. So that's the most substantial piece of adding those revenues. Jessica's gonna be able to explain that to you in very much more detail when she comes to report to the board. But really what it is, is it's kind of like us reporting the revenues and expenditures of a lease agreement. And we have some very large software agreements. If you remember when we adopted our student information system, it's a million dollars plus. So those revenues have now gone on to our books. The same is true also for our expenditures as well too. So when you look at our expenditures, there's about $4.2 million there in increased expenditures. Directly in and out revenue expenditures, that was about $3 million for those software agreements. The other biggest add in both revenues and expenditures was about $1.2 million more in ESSER and 11T dollars. So those are the most substantive pieces of your additions in your revenues and expenditures for this fiscal year. Um, our deficit right now on the books is showing at about $2.5 million. We always at this point now deduct what we believe our predicted variance is gonna be. When you take a look at a 2% predicted variance of a $118 million budget, we are guessing that somewhere in that zero-ish range is where we may fall. We always build things a little bit conservatively. Mr. Shero will always point out to you that we don't, we're not allowed to miss in our school world. If we miss on any account line, if we don't have enough revenues built in there, then we get dinged on our audits. So we always build a little bit of padding there, hence where our variances lie. So much closer to zero than we had predicted before. That takes you to your anticipated general fund balance. Once we make all those adjustments, in March I was telling you we're gonna be somewhere around 28.3. You can see now that that moved just north of about $30 million or 25.3% of our expenditures for the amendment and where we believe that we are gonna end this fiscal year at. Again, footnote, depending on where our variance comes in, those numbers can slide either to the good or to the bad a touch. We move now to our 2324 general fund snapshot. If you have a photographic memory, you'll look at those numbers and say, those are the exact same numbers, Brian, that you presented at the last meeting. That's true with two exceptions. The two exceptions are at the bottom. At this time, what we do now take into consideration is I'm predicting that I'm gonna end this fiscal year better than I did at the last meeting. So I'm adjusting what your general fund balance number is. So I've adjusted that to reflect what I believe is going to be those positive adjustments to our revenues at the end of this fiscal year. That now shifts our predictions for our general fund snapshot um, to an ending at 630.24 of around $27.47 million or 25.4% of expenditures. And of course, those are subject to move as well too, depending on where our final audit plays out. With that, um, I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have, and this will be followed by two action items separately. One action item will be to approve the budget amendment for this fiscal year. That'll be followed by an action item to officially approve the fiscal year 24 budget. Happy to enter entertain any questions that you may have. When do we expect that the uh, budgets will come from the governor? As of today, um, they still believe they'll have June 30, but if you're watching um, in the Senate is the, the rub right now, and so there are a few votes short, or short there of getting that through. So that's what you gotta watch, but they still anticipate before June 30. So our problem is we have to adopt as of June 30, so we get it as close as we can. Um, the February budget amendment will capture any changes in your enrollment then, the audit um, will come back. Um, they'll close it this summer, but they'll report it in September Yes, sir. September about that time and then they'll adjust that as well you get a more true picture in that first February amendment than you actually do at this point in time okay. any other questions I would entertain a motion for 3.1 I move that we adopt item 3.1 final budget budget amendment Motion by Hatfield, support by Lauterbach. Any further discussion on 22-23 final budget amendment? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Brian, do you have something else to present for? Okay. So at this time now we'll 
Move on to 3.2, entertain a motion for approval of 23-24 general operating budget. I move the adoption of item 3.2, the approval of the 2023-2024 general operating budget as presented. Second. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Ringgold. Any further discussion on 23-24 budget? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 3.3, um, <coughs> Midland Federation of Paraprofessional Contract Ratification, Mr. Brutin. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are pleased to present to you the culmination of negotiations that took place between MPS administration and the Midland Federation of Paraprofessionals. We started in the winter. Uh, we finished up about a month and a half ago. Um, we've now gone through all the paperwork pieces and are presenting to you tonight a contract term of two years a change in wage structures that are detailed out in your board packet, some leave allowance adjustments and some enhancements to onboarding professional, um, professional development and also the evaluation template as well too. Again, a detailed summation of that has been communicated to you by the superintendent and also was attached in your board packet. I entertain a motion for 3.3. I need approval of item 3.3, the adoption of the uh, contract ratification of the Midland Federation of Care Professionals. Support. Like Motion by Lauterbach, supported by Hatfield. Any discussion? All right, hearing none. Uh, all in favor of approving 3.3, the MPF contract ratification, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 3.4, Michigan High School Athletic Association, Mr. Sherrill. This is the annual recommendation that we must take in order to join the Michigan High School Athletic Association. In doing so, you agree to abide by all of the rules going forward. Move the adoption of item 3.4, the uh, renewal of the Michigan High School Athletic Association membership. I'll second. Motion by Lauterbach by Horowitz. Any discussion? All in favor of approving item 3.4 of the Michigan High School Athletic Association membership? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. At this time we'll go to item number four which are requests to address the board. Um, do note that I forgot one important thing when we did Mike's retirement that we're going to have ice cream social afterwards. So don't, if you want to hang out and have some ice cream on, on us, uh, please stay after the request to address the board. But um, first up on request to address the board, Johnny Chapman. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to begin by saying um, happy Juneteenth. I've heard that was already acknowledged um, in case there's someone who is not aware of what that is all about. Um, uh, over two and a half years, about two and a half years after slaves were already free, it took a Union Army to go into Texas and to implement that freedom for the slaves. And so that is a reflection of how the work of DE and I is a continual work and I think that is symbolic not ironic that on this day that we can celebrate uh, not celebrate but recognize that that actually occurred um, what I wanted to say today is I wanted to um, give voice to students and parents in the district um, what DNI looks like from the students perspective um, there are some students that I had conversations with and they um, we're willing to come and talk to board members and they want the community to know what they're experiencing inside the four walls and under the roofs of uh, the schools that they attend. Um, two of the students, one of the students want, wanted to be here but was ill. 
another student uh, is preparing for a missions trip and could not make it. And so I'm going to do my best to um, be her voice in this situation, although I, I can't describe what her experience is. It's going to take her to truly describe it. But my, my, my intent behind this is, is twofold. The first thing is, is that there could be an ongoing dialogue between adults and students about what students are experiencing in the classroom, in the hallways, in the building, in order to improve their experience of belonging inside the school system. And then the other aspect of that is, is that there could be some sort of uh, uh, transparency created where parents who are sending their children to Midland Public Schools, that they can be assured that their child has a sense of belonging and a sense of well-being um, within the school. Because uh, out in the community, there are some parents that they're not quite feeling that. Um, the description for this student, the student will be a, um, a senior this year at Midland High School. Her freshman year, her sophomore year, she sat at a table with her, some of her friends at lunch and a biracial young man walked up to the table and exclaimed to them that uh, they were slaves, that they were Nigerians, and that they needed to go back to Africa. And um, her response to that, well, her interpretation of, the, of that was because her skin was black, he automatically assumed that she was from Nigeria. The student got suspended for a week or two and she did not even receive an apology for that situation. And then there was two other situations that she experienced this past December. Um, there was a senior that walked up <coughs> to her and um, acted as if he was going to knee her and then called her the N-word four times. And Thank, say, what are you thanks for joining us, Johnny. Johnny, you always know how to get a hold of me, and the, the door is always open for more. Uh, next up, Dick Delinsky. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Richard Delinsky. I have uh, three children who completed school here at Midland Public at Siebert, Jefferson, and Dow. Each went on to earn a master's degree. Uh, each is married. They all live in Michigan. They each have two kids. They're gainfully employed, and I'm happy to say they're all off my payroll. So I owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Midland Public. <laughs> I'm surely just one of many in Midland who has benefited greatly from the historically outstanding school system that's continued to be in the top tier of school districts in the country thanks in large part to Mike Sherrill's leadership. Whether it's instructional or support services, extracurricular activities, early childhood development, uh, AP, IB programs, infrastructure improvements, thanks to the uh, bond millage that was passed, staff development, school safety and security matters, and much, much more, MPS continues to be one of the best districts in the country by whatever standards and measures schools are judged thanks to Mike's leadership. Mike, of course, has had considerable support in his work from the community at large, from the outstanding staff at all levels in the district, and from a school board, you folks, who are noted for your critical thinking skills, your strategic focus, your emphasis on data-driven and evidence-based decision-making, and just doing what's right for our kids. I want to take this opportunity to recognize you, Mike, for your many years at the helm of Midland Public and for steering us through some very calm waters, but also some very big waves that we've, we've encountered recently as well. And on behalf of what I'm sure and is and confident it's a grateful community, I want to wish you a very successful encore in whatever it is that the next cha chapter of your life may be. May it be everything that you want it to be. Whatever comes next for you, may it bring you happiness and fulfillment. My wife, Donna, and I wish you and Pam a wonderful future with health and happiness and lots and lots of time to enjoy your friends, your, your interests, and your family, and hopefully the Tigers World Series presence. <laughs> <laughs> May the best days of your life be the, be the ones that uh, are, are here from now on. And I, I had a postscript here for Pam that I would like for you to make sure you tell her that when a superintendent retires, there's half as much money 
but twice as much husband. So you better watch for that. <laughs> so, so congratulations uh, on, on your retirement, Mike. <laughs> Warmest regards and best wishes to you. And may God's extravagant blessings be upon you always. All the best from the Dolenskys. Thanks, Dick. Uh, Isla McCubbin Green. Thanks for coming, Isla. Hello, my name is Isla McCubbin Green. I'm a student at Midland High School, and I'm back for another three minute speech about dual enrollment. I was back here in May, and just a recap um, dual enrollment is taking college courses for both high school and college credit. And I'm here to talk to you about how dual enrollment courses, especially those which are three credits and above, should be weighted as honors courses in a student's weighted GPA. To begin, I've had the opportunity to take all level of levels of courses at Midland High, regular, accelerated, and honors. I've even taken five college courses so far. So I've had some hands-on experience of how difficulty, rigor, and class expectations can differ between these courses. College courses are just, if not more so, difficult and rigorous than high school honors courses. One specific example that comes to mind is unlike college, still in my honors courses at Midland High School, I still get guided notes, which are notes where most of it's filled in and you just fill in the blanks, uh, notes where you just fill in verbatim with, with the teacher, and support through assignments like guided outlines, which ensure that we are doing, including everything we need to do in an essay and make sure we don't miss any points. In college, they don't give you these things. They expect you to already know how to write a good essay. They don't give you notes, and if you don't take them, you don't have them. Having, showing, this shows how expectations in college are higher than even honors courses in our high schools. Having dual enrollment courses weighted as honors reflects this higher expectation and rigor that is on students. Additionally, having all dual enrollment courses, which are three credits and above, makes it easier on the district. Right now, there is an evaluation system in place to evaluate whether our dual enrollment course should be weighted as honors. But there are a few flaws. The evaluation system is taking the college course's syllabus and giving it to a teacher in the MPS school district to evaluate. But a detail of cor college course syllabi can vary wildly. Some will give you the learning objectives and all the details, and some will just say, hey, there's three essays then, your final exam is 25% of your grade, and that's it. It's not really always enough for this MPS teacher to evaluate the course. This evaluation system also doesn't ever even talk to the college professor who's teaching the course. And this can lead to some controversial evaluations, which is a problem, especially when there's no real appeal system for these evaluations. In other words, I'm asking that you let all dual enrollment courses, which are three credits and above, be weighted as honors in a student's weighted GPA. This accurately reflects the work and dedication students are putting into college courses while they're still in high school. Now, I'm out of time, but I would love to talk to you more about this in the future, as there's way more than three minutes can put in. Um, there's more information than three minutes. But you have my contact information, as I wrote it down earlier. So if you have any questions, please email me, call me. I would love to tell you more about dual enrollment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Isla. Uh, Jessica Chai. Hi, Jessica. Thanks for joining us. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Chai. I'm a rising junior at Dow High. And first of all, the only reason I can stand here today is because of all the hard work and sacrifices that my first generation immigrant parents have made in order for me to pursue a quality education. I firmly believe that a quality education cannot exist without the physical and psychological safety of students. But how is that possible when I can't even sit with three Chinese friends in class without someone saying, I bet all your parents had sex at an orgy party on Chinese New Year, and that's the only reason you're here today. But worse than the standard microaggressions we face on a daily basis are the stereotypical ways Asians are perceived. The model minority myth. It cuts so deeply when teachers confuse my East Asian friends and I because who wants to believe that they're all one homogenous mixture, that individual identities, stories, families, beliefs, dreams, goals simply don't matter, and that we're all just the same try-hard perfect ner nerd stereotype. 
And who wants to believe it when the people supposed to be their role models tell them indirectly that who they are doesn't matter and maybe never will? What is freedom without individuality? But what happens when you don't fit that stereotype and just because you do, does that mean you win the lottery? Or do you live perpetually in the state of hiding away because you're under a mask of a false persona that others have created for you? But either way, you're powerless. And either way, each decision you make is illegitimatized by the assumptions of others, and no decision you make can win the approval or the acceptance of your peers and teachers. In my younger friends at Jefferson, I see fractured, broken pieces of my former self reflected back at me, and suddenly I'm reminded of my weekly breakdowns due to the perceived burden of representing my culture. Suddenly I'm right back where the weight of expectations crushed the air out of my lungs. And now in the faces of my peers, I see sleeping at 4 a.m., a cycle of depression, anxiety, meds, therapy, self-harm, suicidal ideation, and the cherry on top, humor to brush it all off. Humor, because isn't it funny when someone tells us we're all related? And isn't it funnier that I gaslit myself into thinking I was crazy, that I didn't experience racism, that I was perfectly okay, and stereotypes didn't affect me? Now, I personally think it's funniest that I'm so desensitized that I don't even realize how deeply it hurts anymore. Now, we all know that mental health is an epidemic that plagues all the kids of our generation these days, regardless of race. But I can't help but wonder, how has racial trauma impacted the mental health of students, and being as school is where students spend the majority of their time growing up, how is accountability being held for the damage that's been done? Now, I'm not asking to be praised or rewarded, but will the day ever come when I'm simply seen as myself and not some amalgamation of stereotypes and labels? When will the day when children of color can look into the mirror and say, I belong? When will I be able to say that every student here at MPS feels safe, comfortable, and supported to be truly themselves? As co-chair of the Dow High Student Diversity Board and the Midland Youth Inclusivity Committee, I've spent hundreds of hours leading a team to plan and facilitate cultural awareness events to over 2,700 students and community members over the last two years. I've made it my personal mission to bring more education and awareness to this community. But there's still so much more that we can do, and I'm hopeful that together we can learn and grow and collaborate in the interest of our collective better future. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Jessica. Um, Dennis Kuehl, saying the last name correct? Quail? Quail? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. That completes all the lists that I have. Anybody else that wanted to speak? Thanks for coming. Good evening, Renita Bonides. After attending the majority of school board meetings for almost two years now, I've been amazed at the amount of time and energy that has been put into an ideology that has little to nothing to do with educating the children in this school district. I've sat through 45 minute presentations on DEI. I've listened to all the ways that we need to protect a minute population of the student body. More information has come out, including studies for that very population, where they should be getting professional help rather than expecting the children around them to support their mental Ill illness, perpetuated by their surroundings and parental push. It is of the utmost importance for the schools to get back to teaching the basics, the skills that are required to become a viable adult by graduation. It seems instead of helping those that need the help and providing assistance, instead the district focuses on those that create the greatest financial flow and those that get the most politically in agenda-driven recognition from the public and the community business partners like Dow. What I have re watched and what is absolutely proven at this point in terms of the abuse of the children and the way that they were harmed mentally and emotionally through the various lockdown issues that this elected Board of Education issued for all the sake of receiving ESSER funds. Putting money in your coffers so that you could have lots of access to things and projects at the price of sacrificing the children and an alternative agenda. Then the claim that they now need mental health support through SEL has, nothing, has done nothing more than show that you yet again are willing to take money to further harm the youth and children in this district. As stated here before, and I'll state it again, the Bible addresses those that cause harm to children in Luke 17, 2. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Many of us were placed here to do God's will to protect their innocence. Time is running out for many to choose wisely. In the end, everyone talks to God. 
Also, I paid for the agenda packet for you, which clearly states that the district is to agreed to give me the emails of those at the same time they were made available to the school board members Friday at the latest prior to the meeting. There's been a habit of waiting until Friday to send those to me. I did not receive it last Friday and didn't get it until this morning. When I asked, I was told that it's because they don't work on Fridays during the summer. So I'm asking, did the school board not get these, this 130 page agenda packet until this morning? Otherwise, I should be receiving them earlier in the week. Yet again, stopping transparency and the ability to prepare to address the board with concerns. Thank you. Hi, thank you, good evening. Um, my name is Melissa Scheich, I'm sorry, Melissa Buczek, and I would um, like to bring to mind uh, two instances that happened um, within the past school year. First, a child wrote an undisclosed hateful message on a bathroom stall. Days later, action was taken and the entire district was informed by the superintendent that hate speech is intolerated. The student would potentially have their academic and social life destroyed because of the words written on a stall wall. The community cheered the show. And then something similar occurred when a child was apparently being bullied on the school bus by multiple students. The details were not disclosed, but the student mentioned fighting back with a gun. Three days later, a teacher found out, and the student who made the threat on the bus was arrested and thrown into juvenile detention. Three days later, was he really a threat? We got a message from the city prosecutor at Midland that Midland does not tolerate this. The Midland Police Scanner reported that the child had no access to a gun and therefore this seems not even applicable to, the, to a Michigan code violation. However, when a teacher starts talking to a class about their plastic male genitalia and being able to reproduce with both sexes, Midland Public Schools, the city attorney, and the law enforcement for that matter are all silent. Today, we sent a follow-up email to administration and immediately received a message back. The message was that incidents involving students can be discussed with parents and guardians, but not others. I do appreciate the response, but I don't agree. It was at least the entire class, not just one student. The precedent previously set is that we make a show of what happened to prevent it from happening again, even if the extravagant demonstration is at the child's expense. But on the flip side, it appears that when the issue pertains to sexual abuse of children and um, it's a teacher at fault, we're okay with hiding and protecting this perpetrator. Michigan School Code, MCL 380.1507, paragraph three clearly states the parameters in which sexual topics are allowed in school and this was outside of them. I don't understand why wasn't the entire district informed of what happened and how is it gonna be handled by the administration? Thank you. Last meeting was May 15th. Members uh, present were myself, Jennifer Ringgold, Penny Miller Nelson, and Mike Sharrow. Our guests were DeAndre Hogan, Jen Service, Trisha Clancy, Annalisa Christensen, Shannon Panasic, and Kim Welter. We met at the Midland Public School Administration Building. Uh, we got a summer school update. MPS is offering uh, multiple summer school options to students K through 12. A summary report will be provided in the fall. Benchmark Assessment Report 98B requirement. The end of the year benchmark assessment report was shared with the committee and it will be posted on the website per Michigan Department of Education requirements. We got a diversity, equity, inclusion update. Progress continues with each school developing a goal and action plan with the area of images, celebrations, and events. The plans will be implemented during the 23-24 school year with ongoing support from the principal, DEI director, and cultural and climate leader at each school. Elementary 
literacy update. The literacy team provided an update about the current elementary liter literacy curriculum implementation, including details about how the curriculum aligns with the science of reading, which are research-based practices. The team discussed the importance of the coaching model and providing ongoing support to teachers. The team shared examples of student work and student agency within the units of studying in reading, writing, and phonics. We adjourned at 2.30. Thanks. Um, item 5.2 for information textbook adoption. Ms. Miller-Nelson. Good evening. I do have a textbook for information this evening. I bring to you for our geometry honors section at both of our high schools that course is offered. The title of the text is Elementary Geometry for College Students. The publisher is Cengage with a copyright of 2020. This is the newer version of the existing book. I'll have you know that our teacher leaders and math teachers have reviewed um, multiple versions and have settled on this book based on the criteria. It's available uh, outside my office for anyone who wants to take a look at that for the 28-day review period. Thank you. And then 5.3 yes. for action. Uh, yes. At the last board meeting I brought to you, uh, excuse me, the May board meeting, I brought to you uh, the chemistry book for information. It's back tonight for your action. And of course, uh, should you choose to approve this, it's pending final um, budget approval and availability of funds. This book is for our AP Chemistry Honors class at both of our high schools. The title is Chemistry, a Molecular Approach. The publisher is Pearson. It has a 2023 copyright. All right, thank you. Entertain a motion for 5.3. The adoption of item 5.3, the uh, uh, textbook adoption as presented by Ms. Miller Nelson. Motion. motion by Lauterbach, support by Horowitz. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of approving item 5.3, textbook approval, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item six is finance facilities and operations. Item 6.1 are the study committee minutes from June 5th. Thank you, Phil. The FFO committee met on June 5th. Uh, present were myself, uh, Brad Blazy, John Hatfield, Mike Shero, Penny Miller Nelson, and Brian Brutin. Uh, we also had several guests uh, present from French and Associates. We had Dale Jerome from Barton Mallow. We had Jeff Atkins, Kelsey Berkmeyer, Daryl Dombro, and Brian Jesse. We had distributed for reading and review in advance of the meeting uh, the April financials. Uh, revenues, expenditures, and transactions above the th bid threshold were provided. There were no significant variances of note. Workers' compensation renewal. The administration will recommend renewing coverage with the Yiter Insurance Agency. Printer bid. Bids were uh, solicited to replace printers throughout the Midland Public Schools. The current printers were purchased in 2018. The administration will recommend award uh, of that contract at tonight's board meeting. Series 3 bond funds will be utilized for the purchase if approved. Meal prices. The administration will recommend a 25 cent increase in meal prices for the 23-24 school year. Price increases are mandated by law. The last price increase was in 2019. Food service equipment bid. The administration will recommend awarding a food service equipment bid unanticipated revenues from state and federal sources continue to arrive. And then we had an in-person presentation regarding the facilities uh, study. Findings from the facility study were presented to the committee by representatives from French and Associates and Barton Mallow. The committee will meet with the representatives again in July to continue discussion on the findings. Next FFO meeting will be July 17, 2023. Thanks, John. All right, that takes us to to item 6.2, the printer bid, printer bid, Mr. Brutin. Thank you, sir. Uh, per the minutes that uh, Mr. Lauterbach just read, bids were accepted to replace all of the printers throughout the Midland Public Schools. As was noted in those minutes, our current printers were purchased in 2018 and are rapidly approaching end of life. A detailed narrative was provided for you in the board packet <coughs> that spelled out the extensive RFP process and all of the purchase details that go along with this recommendation. Um, after the tech team putting many hours into reviewing the proposals, administration is recommending that we issue a purchase order to Xerox Business Solutions, Midwest of Bolingbrook, Illinois, for 
$359,814.29. And if approved, Series 3 bond funds will be utilized for the purchase of the printers. All right. Entertain a motion for item 6.2. I move uh, adoption of item 6.2, uh, acceptance of the printer bid. Support. Motion by Hatfield, support by Lauterbach. Any discussion on 6.2? 6, 6 do we recycle the ones that we have? What do we do with them? We'll, we'll defer to Mr. Dietzik as he gets his mic. I see him grab his mic. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yes, we do. Um, they'll, they'll be recycled. The will help us recycle them. Okay. Right. Um, any further questions? All right. All in favor of approval of item 6.2, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, item number 6.3 for information, gifts totaling $13,469.79. Mr. Brutin. Thank you. We wish to express our gratitude and acknowledge the receipt of the 20 gifts totaling the $13,469.79 that you just mentioned this evening. The gifts support a wide range of items, including student clubs, athletic equipment, and various scholarships per tradition. All of the donors will be acknowledged in the broadcast credits and also through board correspondence. We certainly appreciate their generosity. Great. Thank you. Item 7.1 are human resources. I'll just note that we had not met since the last board meeting, hence no minutes from the study committee. But item 7.1 for information, Mr. Jaster. Thanks, Mr. Roush. Uh, we have two retirements to recognize at our meeting this month. Um, as we've already heard, Mr. Shero is officially retiring, so uh, he's vacating the superintendent position as of July 31st, 2023, officially. Uh, also, a recent retiree, Dr. Stephen Poole, uh, most recently was an assistant principal at Jefferson. His retirement was effective May 31st, 2023. And if you'd like, I'll Go just ahead. continue. Um, we also have uh, uh, sad information to pass on. We lost a former employee this past month. Uh, so we extend our sympathy to the family of Miss Betty Spiker. She passed away May 3rd, 2023. She worked in many areas of MPS. I think her most continuous position was down here at our administrative um, building, and she worked in the coordinator's wing uh, for about 11 years and retired in 1984 from that position. Thank you. Um, Item number eight, our correspondence to and from the board, 8.1 for information letters to the Board of Education from the two individuals listed in your packet. Item 8.2 for information letters from the Board of Education to the following individuals, list, individuals and entities listed in the packet. Item number nine, scheduled activities for information are our next uh, six board meetings. July through December as listed and then item number 10 are there any points of clarification or notes from any of the board members all right turn it over to mr. Cheryl I really was going to say much tonight but I, I think I need to say uh, first of all I'm up to a pretty overwhelmed by this and thank all of you for that and bill and his dad have been so good to me through the 10 years i've been here as so many people have been um through the years and ironic that dick spoke i think tonight for him because uh, dick was one of the first people i met i interviewed very nervously the very first round of interviews and the consultant reached back out to me and said hey you're better than what you showed you, you need to show up in the second one and um and dick uh, dick uh, calmly came over and talked to me for 20 minutes and just his knowledge of and passion still for kids you know former board member still out active legacy center early childhood which we had in common because as you know i have a spouse that constantly wants to talk to me about that as well and um and so this community is full of people like dick and it makes it a special place and um, I chose after telling the consultant twice when he called me that I didn't want to come to Midland to finally come and it was that special piece of it that's there that everyone here understands what makes a healthy community and um, I wish for all of you to continue to find that and with that civility and grace needs to return to what we do 
I've had hundreds of conversations with people like Dick about educational topics. He feels free to call me, come people show up in my office. We don't do it in a dialogue in three minutes attacking each other, which has occurred over the last couple of years. So this is a blessed place, a blessed community. Um, thank you for allowing me to serve for 10 years. It's not in the cards probably for me to stay here because I'm going to a different climate and a different place, but it certainly is a great place to be. When I recruited Brian up here, I told him I don't, can't think of a better place, and I've been a lot of places to educate your children than middle public schools. Come take a look at it. And I stand by that today. And everywhere I've been, <clears throat> I said I'm a part of it, so I got to say I'm a muskrat, a Chippewa, a cardinal, um, let's see, a Highlander from Texas, a tiger from Texas, and I'm now a chemical chemic and charger so thank you very much for allowing me to be part of that thank you Mike. with that i'll take a motion to adjourn so moved, so moved. all right all, right. <laughs> all, all in favor <laughs> aye. any opposed Thanks, Jack. thank you Oops. Oops. Oops.